October 27th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 1 Peter, Chapter 1 from the New Testament. From Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those temporarily residing abroad, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, the province of Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by being set apart by the Spirit for obedience and for sprinkling with Jesus Christ's blood, may grace and peace be yours in full measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that is, into an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is reserved in heaven for you who by God's power are protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This brings you great joy, although you may have to suffer for a short time in various trials. Such trials show the proven character of your faith, which is much more valuable than gold, gold that is tested by fire even though it is passing away, and will bring praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You have not seen him, but you love him. You do not see him now, but you believe in him. And so you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy because you are attaining the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who predicted the grace that would come to you searched and investigated carefully. They probed into what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified beforehand about the sufferings appointed for Christ and his subsequent glory. They were shown that they were serving not themselves, but you in regard to the things now announced to you through those who proclaim the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things angels long to catch a glimpse of. Therefore, get your minds ready for action by being fully sober and set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Like obedient children, do not comply with the evil urges you used to follow in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, You shall be holy, because I am holy. And if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, Live out the time of your temporary residence here in reverence. You know that from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, you were ransomed, not by perishable things like silver or gold, but by precious blood like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb, namely Christ. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for your sake. Through him you now trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. You have purified your souls by obeying the truth in order to show sincere, mutual love. So love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You have been born anew, not from perishable, but from imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was proclaimed to you. God, I love how Peter writes. It is so filled with imagery and grandiose words of our faith. Uh, our walk with you, most importantly, uh, the idea of sovereignty and just how big you truly are. One of my favorite verses in this first chapter is verse 4, where it talks about our inheritance and our inheritance being uh, salvation, forgiveness of our sins, eternal life with you. Um, and the list could go on and on, but those are some of the big ones of what our inheritance is. And verse 4 says that our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. One of the things that is one of those 
gray areas in the Christian church or one of the things that Christians like to discuss over and over again is whether you can lose your faith, uh, whether you can lose your salvation. And this conversation drives me crazy. And it drives me crazy for this one particular reason. Because if we believe that we can lose our salvation, then we're saying it's up to us whether we get to keep or lose our salvation. And to me, that is such an arrogant point of view. Whether you can lose your salvation or not is not the issue, but just the fact that you think you're in charge of your salvation, there and then I have, I have problems with that. Because myself, I have lived a life of arrogance, of being self-focused. And you and I have both worked endless hours on getting me to focus on you rather than on me. So to think something as gigantic as our salvation has to do with us is baffling to me. John 15, 16 says that you chose us, that we didn't choose you. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says that our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And it goes on in various places in the Bible. Uh, Romans, 1 John. In 1 John, it actually says, If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, if you truly have been saved, key point, if you truly have been saved, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. God, we, we can't understand sovereignty. We, we really struggle with that for a couple of reasons. One, that concept is beyond the limits of our brain. This infinity, sovereignty, bigger than we can even imagine. The same, for the, the same thing for the love that you have for us. Like we don't understand why you would give up everything, including your son, to keep drawing us near to you. Um, that is baffling to us. So this idea of sovereignty, that somebody is so passionate about this creation that he made, that even though we try to defile our faith, and even though we try and fade in and out of our faith, and even though we try and make it perishable, you're like, nope, I will have none of that. If you are saved, if you have uh, inherited your inheritance, if it is already set up for you in heaven, I'm not going to let you go anywhere understand you may go through hard times you may struggle with your faith um, and that's all part of that and I know every time I've struggled with my faith not that I doubted in you but just doubted in uh, kind of everything having to do with me as I came out of those situations kind of spiraled back out of those situations I know my faith was so much deep for I learned so much more about our relationship and I know sometimes that spiraling in and out of faith sometimes goes on for years or decades. Um, but I know that once, once we're saved, there's nothing you're going to do to change that. Again, the Bible is pretty clear about the fact that you're not going to allow them to be snatched out of your hands for anything. So verse 4 to me is amazing because it's saying, no, you can't do anything. And nobody else can do anything to your salvation either. Once you are saved, once you have been assigned that inheritance, it is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And God, that, that verse means so much to me when you go on and say it is reserved in heaven for you. By God's power, by God's power, I'm protected through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. By your power, I am protected. Because God, you know that when my life has spiraled out of control and I'm, I struggle with my belief systems, again, I never lose sight of my belief in you, but just that walk with you and that passion for you. And we all have times like this, if we're being honest. I am so thankful for verses like this to know that even in my darkest hours when I'm messing up so much that you say, I don't think you understand, you know, I sent my son, the unblemished lamb to die for your sins. I don't think you get that connection, Janelle, because if you got that connection, you would understand 
that you're going to walk this path. It might be a wandering path, <laughs> but you're going to walk this path. And you are my child. I have written your name in my book a long time ago. And I will be with you on this walk and my power is going to protect you. There is nothing you can do, Janelle, to change that. Which on some days is a really good thing, God. Because some days I mess up really bad. God, I know that, that some people will bristle at what I'm saying. Um, because it's contrary to what they believe. And, and it's it's fine. It's one of those areas that's a little bit, like I said, a little bit gray in the Christian world. And people like to discuss this at length. But the one thing we need to agree on whether you can lose your salvation or not, the one thing we have to agree on is that you are sovereign, that it is your power that controls everything, not us, that it is your choice, your decision, your goodness, your love for us that allows us to exist here on earth. We need to get that right, and we don't, mainly because we have such a hard time grasping that concept of how big you are. And part two is because we want to be in control. We want to think that we have a say in what we do, what we don't do, what happens, what doesn't happen. And that's a whole discussion about free will that we'll have to save for another time. But if we don't understand what sovereignty means, at least as far as our brains can understand it, We've completely missed the point. We've missed the point about why you put us here on earth. We've missed the point why you even created us in the first place. We've definitely missed the point that it's all about you. That it's all about us glorifying you. And I don't know how much glorifying of you we can do if we think we're in charge of our salvation. God, I for one am... <laughs> very thankful for your power. I'm thankful that you are in charge of my salvation and not me. Because I would be like the people in the Old Testament, constantly scared to death that every five minutes I had lost my salvation. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure why you love us that much to give up your only son for us. I don't get that. I don't understand it. And I probably won't in this lifetime. But what I do understand is even though I, I can't grasp the bigness of it, I do understand that I'm here on earth to glorify you. That everything here on earth was created to glorify you. We miss that point so often, God. I, for one, I'm glad I serve a God that's bigger than I can understand. Back in Deuteronomy, it talks about that. Uh, chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awesome God who is unbiased and takes no bribe, who justly treats the orphan and widow and who loves resident foreigners, giving them food and clothing. So you must love the resident foreigner because you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. Revere the Lord your God. Serve him, be loyal to him, and take oaths only in his name. He is the one you should praise. He is your God, the one who has done these great and awesome things for you that you have seen. You must love the Lord your God and do what he requires. God, thank you for loving me in such a big way that it fills in all my deficiencies. Thank you for your grace and your mercy in my life that allows me to exist day to day and glorify you in the path that you've asked me to walk. Thank you for being such a gigantic God, a God that I 
we'll never fully understand. Who does crazy awesome things that are beyond my comprehension. But allow me, just because I don't understand it, allow me to accept it. That you are sovereign in my life. And that I was created to glorify you. And I need to get that priority straight. And stop doing it backwards. In your son's name I pray. Amen.